Wow, God is so merciful, so kind. Um, let's just, let me give a short exhortation to summarize this passage from today. Let us pray. Father, to call you Father is a privilege. Why are we here? Why can't we be here? Not because of anything good we bring. Simply to the cross we cling. Father, would you speak clearly, help us to hear, to meet with you, to understand this passage. Glorify yourself. Help me to step out of the way. With Jesus Christ alone, like his disciples, proclaiming him, would he be the name, the only name that everyone hears today. We pray and ask all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. I have to laugh a bit because I think when we started praying, I heard someone start their watch. <laughs> Is someone timing me? <laughs> this past Sunday, I preached in Gardena, and I preached the longest sermon ever in my life, close to an hour. Lord have mercy. <laughs> still alive. The church is still smiling. So Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 16. We will skip all the background because we already went over it in our Bible study. Just to get straight to the meat of it. Verses 14 to 16, we see the consequences of preaching the truth. And King Herod heard it, for his name had become... Well known. His name. This is Jesus' name. This happens right after Jesus sends out the 12 disciples, two by two, to go out and proclaim the gospel, to preach repentance, and to also giving them authority to do miracles, cast out demons. And notice, King Herod heard it. King. He's called a king in this passage. He is a ruler from Rome. They gave him the ability to rule over the Jewish people. So he heard the news. It, eventually, the work that the disciples were doing were effective. People were hearing the news, not about 12 men who could do amazing things. But notice, all the disciples, they pointed to the name of Jesus. Jesus was the one who was becoming famous, his name. And people were saying, because the, hearing this news about the gospel, about Jesus, people were saying, what were they saying? Were they saying what the disciples were preaching? The disciples were preaching, there is the Christ, the Christ is here. Mm -hmm. But all the people were saying different things. They were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. This actually shows all the people also know how John the Baptist died. They not only know John the Baptist is a holy, righteous man, but they know the way how he died. And that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. They're trying to explain why can this, this person, this new man, Jesus, do all these miracles. And others were saying, in verse 15, he is Elijah. And others were saying, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. If you know your Old Testament, or I looked at the cross references, you see in Isaiah chapter 40 of the messenger that God is sending before his son. Or Malachi chapter 4, Elijah is going to return to prophesy. They're, they were much closer, these other people, but the ones who were trying to explain, Jesus is John the Baptist risen from the dead. They, they were just trying to understand, why can this person do miracles now? This is someone who was also a great preacher. Someone who is now becoming even more famous than John the Baptist ever did. You remember how famous John the Baptist was? He was, in Mark chapter 1, he was out in the desert, and the city of, the people of Jerusalem and the city in Judea were going out to him in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. Imagine going to Death Valley today, driving, making that drive all the way over there to hear one guy preaching in the wilderness. That's, that's special, right? It's, that's not some normal preacher. Sometimes it's hard for us to even just go to church when it's, what, 30 minutes away, one hour away. So what does this mean, again, uh, how does this encourage the original audience if your teachers are able to point back to the background of Mark? Mark is writing this book to persecuted Christians. They were seeing this news and seeing 
what do people think about Jesus? Everyone has their own thoughts about Jesus, even today. People who don't who don't know Christianity, they most likely have heard the name of Jesus. And the thing is, those Christians, the ones who are being persecuted, the ones who are losing family, friends, jobs, wealth, house, money, everything, even their very lives for Jesus, they're the ones who know who Jesus really is. And for us today, too. At, at, at the grocery store, even today at Trader Joe's, I was, I was looking at the, the cashier and was praying, is now a good time? Maybe, perhaps it would have been, but often we're afraid. We're afraid even to mention the name of Jesus. But he's the only one who can save them from their sins. Everyone is headed to hell. They need the truth. And this is the consequence of proclaiming the truth. But, but when Herod heard, it, heard this news about Jesus, what did he say in verse 16? He kept saying, John, who am I beheaded, has risen. What is he saying? Most likely, he's guilt, he feels his guilty conscience. He's killed the man. He knows, like someone said in our group, John, uh, Herod, King Herod knows John the Baptist died because he's the one who killed him. Whom I beheaded has risen. But he kept saying that, perhaps out of fear. We see later on in the passage, he's actually afraid of John the Baptist. And just an encouragement, again, we need to go and proclaim who Jesus is. It's a clear message, and it's one that will lead to consequences, <coughs> lead to persecution. So point number one is we see already the consequences of proclaiming the truth, what people thought about Jesus. But point two is the cost of truth. What is the cost of truth? Verse 17 and 18. For Herod himself, emphasizing him, he himself, this is not an idea that other people came up with. This is not, oh, my, the people I rule over, my servants, they went and did something behind my back that I didn't know. No, he himself said, go and arrest this man. Had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison. Why? Is it saying because John the Baptist did something wrong? No. It actually says on account of Herodias. And it explains who Herodias is. The wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. Now what's, we were talking about this, what's wrong about marrying your brother's wife? Uh, thinking logically, even in the Old Testament, it says if, this is, for the, this is only for the Jews, not for today, in the, in the Old Testament. If your brother dies and leaves behind a widow, then it's up to you to marry your brother's widow to raise up offspring for her. Otherwise, she has no man to take care of him, no inheritance to, to take care of her and her children. But here, in verse 18, it explains more on why this is something that's very wrong. For John had been saying, he's been saying multiple times to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He, he's saying, he didn't say it's not lawful for you to have your brother's widow. He's explaining clearly that Philip is still alive, alive and well, or not well actually, because he, yeah, his, his wife left him. And we see that sin leads to more sin. First, he committed the sin of adultery, stealing his brother's wife. Then what does he go on to do? He then throws John the Baptist, the righteous man, the one telling him the truth. He put him in prison. It's the cost of truth. There's consequence for proclaiming repentance. We should expect persecution. Again, this is an encouragement to the Christians back then in Mark's day. It's only normal to, if they hated Jesus, if they hate God, they will also hate the followers of God. They will hate you for proclaiming the truth. If you're, if you're going and saying, I'm a Christian and everyone loves you and, and uh, loves what you're saying about Jesus, like the, I'm talking about everyone as in everyone in the world, then you might be saying something wrong. If you think of all these prosperity gospel preachers, TV evangelists who, man, even, even family members who are not Christian, they, they enjoy listening to these kind of people. And what about us? Uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, one of my aunts asked me, oh, what do you think about Joseph Prince? Is he a good preacher? And I said, in the Old Testament, there would be 400 false prophets who will tell you what you want to hear. 
But then there will be that one true prophet from God who will tell you the things you don't want to hear. That's the true prophet. If there's no conviction of sin, if you're not called to confront yourself, that uh, I'm a selfish, proud, I, we still have, we have all fallen short of perfection of God's standards, and we still have ways to go in this life. If you don't hear the call to holiness, then it's not true preaching. It's not God's word. So we see John the Baptist, the cost of truth, what he's doing. He's telling the truth to King Herod. Now the question is, does that mean we just go to all the leaders in the world and to, and to call out their sins? Uh, I haven't thought about this much, but think about our own pastor. We've heard him, right, from the pulpit mention President Trump, mention Gavin, Gavin, uh, Governor Newsom. But does he ever mention other, other leaders of the world? He doesn't seem to. And I think the understanding is King Herod, he's, remember, the ruler over the Jews. He's also, uh, we know from uh, extra biblical texts, that he's a professing Jew being the ruler of the Jew, hey, I'm one of you. I'm identify with you. And you know President Trump, he's a professing Christian. Gavin Newsom, he's a professing Catholic. If you profess to be a follower of Jesus, then if, if you would use Bible verses in your billboards, in your campaigns, then we must call you out because what you're doing is wrong. And do we do so just because we don't like them? And No. Why do we do so? Why did John do this? John the Baptist. Because he loves Herod. When you love someone, you tell them the truth, even when it hurts. And he was willing to even give up his freedom, be arrested for the sake of Herod, so that Herod would may repent and be forgiven of his sins. So what did Herod do? We'll look in verses 18, uh, 19 to 20. There we see the conviction of truth. So the first point, verses 14 and 16, we saw what people thought about Jesus, the consequences of the truth. Verse, the second point, we see the cost of truth, what it will cost us as Christians, what it cost John the Baptist and the Christians of Mark's day, even Mark's own very life, all the disciples who followed Jesus, all would go on to die except one, who would go on to live to old age. <laughs> then the third point is the, con is the conviction of truth. Truth convicts. When, when you hear God's word taught properly, the Ten Commandments, do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery, we might think, I, I haven't done those things. So I'm pretty good. But then Jesus goes on to explain even more so. Do not murder. If you even hated your brother in your heart, your brother, this is not just a stranger, your own family member. If you, in your heart you called your brother, you stupid then you've already sinned against God. You've sat in the judgment seat that only God should sit in. You've, why is that such a sin against God? Because we're telling God, you're not going to take care of justice. You're not, going to, you're not going to take care of this unjust situation, so I need to go do it myself. And on and on, the other, all the other commandments, do not, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Why? It's not only because it's a sin against your brother. It's a very grave sin, stealing your brother's wife. But most importantly, number one, it's a sin against God. Mm -hmm. You're telling the God that you profess to follow, Yahweh, that my, my current wife is not enough. What you've given me is not enough. You don't know what I need. I'm going to go and uh, I know better than you, God. That's why sin is so evil. And this is why it's so convicting. Now there are two kinds, there are at least there's three kind of reactions we can see from this passage of unbelievers. Verse 19. Now Herodias, this is the one that Herod seduced, or was it Herodias who seduced Herod? Or both? Verse 19. Now Herodias was holding a grudge against him, John the Baptist. And what was her reaction? She wanted to put him to death and was not able. Wow. That's extreme hate. One reaction people will have to the truth is extreme anger. If they can, if they have the, if they have the ability to do violence, mm -hmm. if they could get away with it. For instance, King Herod and Herodias were the, the rulers of the Jews. They could do these things in this area. They have, he didn't even need to have a valid reason, a legal reason to arrest John the Baptist. He just arrested him. 
but she was not able to kill John the Baptist. Why? It's, it's very, it's ironic. The way God protected John the Baptist was none other than verse 20. Through Herod, the one who arrested him. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. And he was keeping him safe. He wanted to keep John the Baptist safe. He knew this man is innocent. I'm the one who is doing something wrong. That his conscience was telling him, just something seems off. Maybe what he's saying, what he's saying is right. So what should I do? He may have been thinking of these thoughts. He might might have even been thinking, hmm. If I profess to follow the God of the Jews, what is the right thing to do? So that when he heard him, he was very perplexed, very confused. He didn't understand. But he used to enjoy listening to him anyway. Again, this is John the Baptist, who we know from the other Gospels, the man among men. There's no one else who is greater than John the Baptist, born of women, apart from Jesus. This is the one who would pre be preaching in the wilderness, and hundreds of thousands would flock to him to hear him preach, even if they didn't believe his message. There's an illustration. Benjamin Franklin, you know him, a very famous American of the past, invented many, many things. I think what he discovered, electricity or something. Mm -hmm. He would go out and listen to George Whitfield, probably the greatest evangelist after the Apostle Paul. He would preach to he would preach to hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people in the open, no microphone. This is someone God raised up in America as a great preacher, as a great evangelist. Benjamin Franklin would go and listen to, he would write about it. He'd go and listen to George Whitfield preach. And while listening to him preach, he would he'd be convicted by the message. And he, he would start giving some of the money that he had in his wallet. And by the time, by the, by the whole sermon was finished, he had given his whole wallet. And yet, this is also Benjamin Franklin who would not be known as a Christian. He would all, he, he's a very immoral person, actually, and never became a Christian. It's a warning for all of us that, especially for y'all who, growing up in a Christian home, you have the privilege of parents who love the Lord and uh, want to see you come to know Jesus. But the question is, do you know Jesus? Not just know about him. Herod even knew things about Jesus, though he didn't believe it. He, his conscience... He came up with the wrong idea that this is probably John the Baptist who I killed. But it's a warning to us all that it's you don't want to just be near heaven. You don't want to just be so close to heaven, so close to the truth, but not in the truth. Because in the end, that's still apart from God. That's still hell, eternal separation from God. We know what John the Baptist preached, Mark chapter 1, verse 8. After me, uh, seven and eight. After me, one is coming who is mightier than I, whose straps of his sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. I baptize you now with water, John the Baptist, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He will do something that no man, near, no mere man can do, because he is the Christ. John was actually the first one to meet Jesus. We made that observation in our Zoom Bible study. When, when Mary, when Mary was pregnant with Jesus and went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John, not known yet as John the Baptist, but John the Baptist. The, the baby left in her womb, in Elizabeth's womb, at the, at the knowing that his Lord was near. John was the first one to meet Jesus, and Jesus, who is greater than John the Baptist, he, both of them would not be arrested and killed until God's perfect time. Jesus would not be arrested and killed until he allowed them to. And for this conclusion, I'd like to make comparisons. First, between King Herod and John the Baptist. You have the puppet king and the herald, the messenger of the king. King Herod was a king, we see in verse 14. John the Baptist was a prophet. King Herod was infamous. He was known as the murderer of John the Baptist, as the one who married his brother Philip's wife, stole his brother's wife. John is famous for the message he proclaimed of being the one who is a prophet sent from God. King Herod is alive by this time, by this 
passage. John is dead. Herod is afraid of man. Verse 17. He was afraid. He was afraid of man. And yet John is one who fears God. Herod was afraid to die. Yet John the Baptist was not afraid to die in proclaiming the message. Herod was the unrighteous one, unrighteous. John the Baptist was the a righteous one, a holy man who followed God. Herod rejected the truth while John the Baptist proclaimed the truth. We see the difference between the worldly King Herod and also the holy man of God, John the Baptist. The puppet king and the herald of the king. But there's even one. What should be the application of our message? Is it, you need to be like John the Baptist and do these things. Yes, we need to follow his example and live after God. But there's actually an even greater message here. Remember, Mark chapter 1 verse 1. What is the purpose of all this? Why does Mark give this book to to the Christians of his day. It, 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 yes, encouraging them to be like John the Baptist, to be fearless, to fear God, to not be afraid to die, to be the one, the ones who follow God, who set your apart, set yourself apart as holy, proclaiming the truth of God. But why? I'd like to end with this comparison between John the Baptist, who is the man of, of among all, above all men, among all men, born of women, the herald of the king but compared with Jesus, who is the man above every man. He's not only man, but also fully God, the true king. You have the messenger, but then you have the true king. John is the prophet sent from God. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John is famous, but Jesus, even today and in the future, he will be the one given the title Lord, the name above every name, names that at his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is God. John the Baptist, yes, he's dead physically, but what is, where is our Lord Jesus? He is the life. He is the resurrection, and he is alive today. He died on the cross 2,000 years ago, but rose from the dead to show us he is the Christ. He's not just the risen John the Baptist. He is the Christ himself. He is Jesus. John is one who feared God and followed after God, and Jesus is the one he followed, the Son of God, God himself. John the Baptist was not afraid to die. Jesus, he himself came, was born on this earth. He lived to die. He came to die for sinners like you and me, for those who have no hope, no righteousness of our own. John the Baptist was a righteous man who followed God, and remember, Jesus is the righteousness of men. John the Baptist lived the holy, uh, holy life unto God, but Jesus is known as the Holy One of the Bible, the Holy One. And finally, John the Baptist came to proclaim the truth, proclaim the gospel, but Jesus himself, our true king, he is the gospel. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the reason why we can have courage living in this world, why we can take courage even when persecution comes our way, and not just persecution. Maybe we haven't been persecuted so much in your own circles, but there's something, if you're a Christian here today, I know you because I know myself. You're a sinner. We're sinners, you and me. And we fall short of God's standards every day. And there are probably days in your life where, how can, I, how can I call myself a Christian? How can I be a Christian when I still fall short in the way I love my family, in the way I treat others, in the, in the words I say or the actions I do or even the things I think. And yet the hope that we have is the same one that John the Baptist had. Is That's why. Not because of anything we bring, nothing of our own we bring, simply to the cross I cling. The hymn says, Foul I to the fount I fly to Jesus. Wash me, Savior. Or I die. There is only one who can forgive sins. It's not because of good works, not because of anything we do, but because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. He died the sinner's death on our behalf, and he rose from the dead three days later. Do you believe that? Let your life reflect it, that Jesus is your greatest treasure, and your guide, and your savior. 
your Lord and friend. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word, which is true, which is true in spite of who we are, whether we live a holy life like John the Baptist or whether we we sin and follow the ways of King Herod, Herodias. Either way, you are still the truth, the way, the life. Nothing can change who you are because you are God. Your word stands true. It will never change. Even when heaven and earth pass away, you will remain. Father, forgive us when we don't treasure you, when we live our own selfish lives. How painful it is. We don't understand what we've done against you. Help us, remind us again, not only of the scars on your hands, on your feet, in your side, but remembering that you took hell on yourself. You took the Father's punishment, anger, wrath on yourself, on that cross, so that all those who believe in you believe that you are able to pay that infinite price because you are the holy and infinite God that we can have, we can live forever with you. And like John the Baptist, Father, would you give us courage to live this life in spite of the persecution, in spite of our own sin, and help us to even live more holy lives devoted to your word, turning away from sin. Please don't let us be like Herod, who came close to the truth, who even enjoyed listening to the truth, but in the end never accepted the truth and followed his own ways and is now eternally separated from you in hell. Father, help us to follow in the footsteps of John the Baptist, in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, for your glory. We pray and ask all this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd just like to close again with the song, O oh, Great God. Again? Yes. Yeah, again. It's a great, it's a great song. It's not just a song. Think about it.